Well, without further delay, I want to welcome uh, Pastor Steve Castle uh, from Beloved Church in Lena, Illinois. He and I have known each other about two years now, somewhere in that vicinity. He did have occasion to come to our building in Tiffin, and uh, he and I uh, met over a coffee along with uh, our dear friend, Pastor Randy Stone. And um, I just knew from listening to him, he is a Jerry Savelle uh, student of Jerry Savelle Ministries. Didn't know that at the time, found out later. That's not why he's here, though. He's here because he has an anointing on his life to destroy yokes and remove burdens from off of people's lives. And I want you to receive him as such with the honor that's due any man or woman of God. Life Point, you know what we do. Would you stand to your feet and welcome none other than Pastor Steve Castle from Beloved Church, Lena, Illinois. Amen. Thank you, Liberty Cup. Man, that's always the uh, super, sit down. That, that's always the super awkward part. Because uh, anything that's good in me is Christ Jesus. And so, but I also know that, you know, if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, then you'll have a prophet's reward. And so I understand the dynamic be that goes between the two. Um, but it's just, it's really hard on me because I know it's, there, there isn't anything in me that makes this thing happen. It's just my yieldedness to the, to the kingdom of God. <clears throat> so you said, take your liberty. So you've been. There are some things that are hidden that you hid. Um, when you were little and impressionable. There were impressions that were forced upon you that were never supposed to be yours. And because of it, some of the things that you thought that your life should be like were hidden away because you started to see yourself differently based upon other people's opinions and other people's actions. Mm -hmm. So from now on, the only thing that flows from you is the glory of God. Amen. And there is nothing hidden that his light has not revealed it back to its original intent. That's what redeemed means is that it goes back to its original intent and it has more value than what it started with. Amen. So back to the original intent of what God created for your life, Amen. your ministry, Amen. and the people that you have affected and will affect Amen. times the ability that God brings into the situation now Amen. is what's available to you. Amen. No more hiding. No more walls, no more closed doors. And I know that opens up maybe evil people to do evil things, but it also opens up magnitudes of the love of God, of the heavenly host, and of the glory that you were supposed to have from the very beginning to shine and reflect through you. No more hiding. No more hiding. Amen. Amen. I know what it's like to sit on that side when, when some guy's doing this, like, oh, God, please have him call me out. And then the other side is, oh, God, don't let him look at me. Amen. And we have such jacked up ideas about how our father is. It is so, like, I, if I call you out and it's what you wanted, um, praise God. But, you know, God can speak anything to you in a closet. But most of the time we don't want to go in a closet. The other thing is, too, that God is not here to make you feel bad about you. That's why Jesus went to the cross. Because he felt bad about you. So depending on how you take that, you know, the, the prophetic is for 
exhortation, edification, and comfort. If it's not that, it ain't prophecy. Condemnation is not in there. Revelation uh, 19 says that uh, the prophetic, the prophetic utterances are based on the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if it isn't true about Jesus, it's not true about you. How many times have we heard some bad, jacked up, negative, evil prophecies? And because someone tags on the end of it, thus saith the Lord, it ends up drilling into our heart more than it should. Right. That's right. If it ain't true about Jesus, it ain't true about you. Because right. God sees you through Christ. And I, none of that stuff was... There might even be some uh, um, there might be some extra uh, later too. I don't know. I, you know, you, when you come, some of you, I, I know Pastor Tommy's um, experienced this because he's a, he's a well-versed, anointed man of God, and I, I'm literally humbled to be here in his church because uh, um, his uh, his ability, his anointing, his um, his humility, his humility, his humility, his servitude, literally went before him. I knew about Tommy before I knew Tommy. <laughs> That's kind of cool. <laughs> and then I met him. And I didn't hear the half of it, amen. <laughs> and so to stand here uh, amongst you, people that he has um, spent however long, years and years and years pouring himself into and through, um, what an honor for me. And you guys, what you did this morning, I mean, that near brings me to tears. But it's not normal. That doesn't normally happen in churches. I know, I pastor a church. <laughs> They're not standing in line every Sunday to say, Pastor, we just want to honor you with some really fun stuff. Like, really? <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> Here you go. And then someone sneaks up behind you and, yeah! Oh. <laughs> Y'all had me going. <laughs> Amen. So what you guys did, I mean, that was from the heart. It was, it was moving me. Amen. So I'm Steve. Um, I was born in, in little bitty nowhere, Illinois. Um, little bitty nobody family. Um, I struggled through most of my life. My dad was a cult leader, so we were um, super, super jacked up as a family um, in every way you could be jacked up particularly in the aspect that I really didn't know who God was because we were told who God was through a cult filter. And some of you have come out of some of that where, you know, God was a big mean ogre hanging over the railings of heaven with a lightning bolt and a big gray beard just waiting for you to make some jacked up mistake so he can kill you because he'd been wanting to kill you your whole life because you're such a sorry cuss and... You know, I, I just, I live my life based upon Bon Jovi's song. If he's going to take me out, he's going to take me out in a blaze of glory. I'm going out in a blaze of glory. And so I spent, I spent nearly all of my teenage years doing everything I could to bring on that blaze. <laughs> and the shocking thing was, is I never got blazed. Jesus got blazed for me. And then I found out about it, and it wrecked me. It absolutely wrecked me. How could God love me 
After all the things I did to him, in that while yet we were sinners, Christ died for us. We were enemies to the cross. He died for his enemies. We curse our enemies. We want, we want horrible things to happen to our energy enemies. We pray against our enemies. We want our enemy enemies in, in politics to not get elected and die a horrible, wretched death. We want... Our enemies next door that God calls our neighbors for their dogs to die. And, and Jesus hung on a cross for his enemies. And I was one of them. I was on purpose with it. I remember literally standing there one day and I pointed my finger up to God in heaven. I said, look, you leave me the F alone and I'll leave you the F alone. And I lived by my side, but he didn't live by his side. <laughs> Where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. Around 20, I got wrecked by the goodness, the love, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And somehow it came through some crazy southern redneck hillbilly named Kenneth Copeland on a, on a tape 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 set for you young folks google it there used to be these little things called cassette tapes that would go in your car and words and music would come off them it was magical and uh and brother copeland on this tape set told me about a god who keeps covenant by blood and i'd never in my whole life ever had anything like that not in my whole life had no idea that people didn't lie to you, didn't want to use you, didn't want to abuse you, didn't want to take things from you, that they did things because of covenant. It wrecked me completely. Gave my heart to Jesus Christ on the side of Baileyville Blacktop, headed north. I pulled over. I was crying. I was way, way, way too tough to cry. I was 19 years old, and my favorite pastime on the weekends was to go somewhere that I had never been and get in a fight that I'd never been in before. <laughs> With somebody, that's who I was. The last time I cried, I was 12 years old when my dad beat me. Um, and we, in our family, we learned, I was the third brother of four, and we learned that the way that you uh, stopped dad from beating you was that you beat him back. And so at 12 years old, I figured out how to fight, beat my dad back, beat my dad back, quit, and that was the last time I'd ever cried. So at 19 years old, when I met God, I'm bubbling like an idiot. I'm pulled over on the side of the road because I can't drive because I'm crying. I'm way too tough to cry, so something must be going on. And I said to God, I said, if you'll take me, if this is really who you are and you'll take me, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. But if this is not who you are, if this is just some other um, slick tongue trick by some other greasy palm preacher that just wants my money, then I'm telling you, just like I told you before, leave me alone. And from the top of my head on the inside, and it's hard to explain, it was like warm honey washed over the inside of me. And by the time it got to the bottom of my feet, I was as new as you could ever possibly be. Everything left. Worst sinner's prayer ever. Best results ever. <laughs> Drove home in my 1978 Olds Delta 88 and ran into my upstairs apartment where my living girlfriend was and said, baby, you need to listen to this tape set. And she said, listen to a tape set. Why would I listen to a tape set? Because you need to. <laughs> Somehow I convinced her to listen to it a couple weeks later or maybe even a week. She came back. She said, is this for real? I said, I know, right? <laughs> she said, what am I supposed to do with this? I said, I don't know. Here's how I prayed. And in my prayer, there was some really dirty words. And I told her what my prayer was because I didn't know if it was the formula. Like, that's how you prayed. Like, you had to have the dirty words in it or not. I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know nothing. All, everything I knew before was all jacked up religion. And so I didn't, I'm like, look, this is what I prayed. And she said, well, I ain't praying that. I said, uh. I don't blame you. So she changed it up to however it fit her, and she same thing happened. She got 
the love of God. It was like God was no respecter of persons. So we, uh, we figured out real quick in a, and in a hurry that we had to do something. We're, uh, we're living together. Went to my parents' house and my stepdad, he hates it when I tell this story because he, he still to this day says that it's not true, but I'm telling you, I was there. <laughs> and I was born again, so everything had to be right. <laughs> and uh, I went back to my, uh, my parents' house and my stepdad, my mom got divorced when we were 13. And uh, my stepdad, I was in there testifying to mom about all this great stuff that just happened to me in the car and my, and my girlfriend and all this. And, and she was just, you know, she'd been believing God in my whole life for me to get, get right because she had a prophecy over me when I was in her womb that I was going to teach the love and the goodness of God. I was going to travel the world and preach and teach the love and the goodness of God. Well, I tell you, that'll jack you up when you're 16 and drunk and you got two girls downstairs in your bed. And your mom says, you know, you're going to preach and teach the goodness of... <laughs> Woman, you have lost your mind. <laughs> now leave me alone. I'm sleeping off a hangover. She just kept at it too. It's a whole story there. So I'm in the kitchen testifying about what God has did. And it's amazing. And I had no way of testifying. Like I didn't know about this testimony stuff. All I knew was this garbage religion. And so I was just, and my stepdad came in, and he's really, really gruff. And he was on the railroad for like 20 years, and he was a roofer. And I mean, he's just one of those man's man's and tough and gruff and doesn't love anybody or anything, and except my mom. Man, does he love my mom. And uh, he came in the room, he said, so, found Jesus, huh? I said, yes, sir. He said, you still living with that hussy? I said, yes, sir. He said, you know, fornicators go to hell. I said, no, I didn't know that. What's a fornicator? He said, well, you know, you living with that hussy. I said, me living with somebody? He goes, no, what y'all do? And I'm like, what do we do? It finally got to me. I mean, I didn't know what fornication was. It was just one of them Bible words. So I went, I dropped Kay off at, at her parents' house, which was about five miles away from my parents' house. And I drove over to Kay's. I said, baby, come here. Snuck her off to the side. I said, will you marry me? And she's like, yeah, I'll marry you. I'm like, cool. All right, I'll be back later. So I drove back over to my parents' house. Got my stepdad. I said, it's all good, sir. She'll marry me. So we won't be fornicating. He's like, okay, when are you getting married? I said, well, you know, I mean, whenever. He goes, well, I got a preacher friend in Rockford. You can get married next weekend. I said, okay, that's cool. <laughs> Hung out with mom, testified some more. Jim was happy. Mom was happy. I'm happy. Amen. Kay's got to be happy. Look what she got. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Went back, picked her up. We're driving back to our little apartment. I said, this is exciting, baby. We're going to get married. She goes, yeah, we're going to get married one day. I said, well, you know, in like 10 days. She said, <laughs> you're crazy. We ain't getting married in 10 days. I said, we got to. We're going to hell. <laughs> she said, I thought we prayed out of that. I said, I don't know. I just saw the fornication in hell, and I don't know. We just got to get right. <laughs> Somehow in 15-minute drive, I don't even know how. She doesn't know how. Neither of us. We cannot remember. It must have been the grace of God. Somehow in 15 minutes, I convinced her to marry me in 10 days. And we went and stood. We eloped because nobody knew except my parents. And we paid for that later, too. And we eloped and we got married. And so two years later, went to JSMI. Convinced her to move with me to Texas. To the metropolitan area of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Two kids that had never lived in a town bigger than 3,000. And we were... She was 20, 19, I was 21. And this is before internet, this is before, we had to fax in our apartment registration, our apartment application. Fax, anybody remember a fax? Yeah. Amen. That was even before pagers, if you remember a pager. And so we um, went and just basically started our destiny. 
did incredible, amazing, wonderful things for God and made some of the greatest mistakes I'd ever made in my entire life. All at the same time. Man, thank God for his grace. So who in here thinks that God is able to work all things together for good? You know, I just told you all a half truth. This is how religious some of us are. I'm not looking at anybody. This is how this is how religious some of us all are. You get half a scripture and you're ready to shout and jump. Let's try it again. How about this? Um, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. Anybody believe that one? Yeah, that's a half a scripture. How about this? And you and the truth shall make you free. Half a scripture. None of those promises work for anybody that just heard those half scriptures. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, John 8, 31. You know, to continue in his word, you have to be in the word to continue. A lot of folks can't even quote a promise, but they know, you know, I, we've, we've seen so many miracles, incredible, incredible things. We've seen blind eyes open, cancers healed, all kinds of incredible things. And I'll have, when people come up, one of the first things I'll say to them is, okay, what do you believe in God for? And they'll tell me what they're believing God for. I say, okay, what scripture are you standing on? Mm-hmm. Well, you know that one. Mm-hmm. Do I know or do you know? Because I know a bunch, but I don't know what you're standing on. And if you're not standing on a scripture, what are you standing on? An idea, an opinion, a feeling, because a lot of folks are. I just don't want this to happen no more. Okay, well, God bless you and every other person trapped in slavery to something that the devil's done to them. Just because you don't want something to happen doesn't mean that God has the ability to work together in that. There's a lot of things I don't want to happen. Amen. Anybody ever watch the news? Do you think God don't want any of those things to happen? This is why people have bad opinions of who God is. Well, if God was really good, then why is this and why is that and why is this? Because he just doesn't have any rights to work in those situations. That's right. That's right. If you continue in my word, then you shall be my disciples indeed. John 8, 31. So there's two things there that most people completely gloss over before they get to the freedom part. One, continuing in the word, which means you have to start in the word. Two, disciple. Anybody know what the root word of discipleship is? Discipline. You know how you make folks flee to church? You tell them discipline. Amen. It's a cuss word in Christianity. Cuss word. And then we go, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you three, free. You'll know the truth. So you got to be in the word and then continue in the word. And then you've got to literally be committed to discipleship. From that place, there is an opportunity for you to know truth. Do you know what it means to know truth? You know that word for know there? Nosco is the same word that was used in Luke chapter 1, in Luke chapter 2, in Matthew chapter 2, where it says that Mary knew not her husband Joseph until she conceived. Knew not. It's talking about the sexual union between a husband and a wife joined in a holy matrimony. In other words, the most intimate way you could ever know anybody and you will know the truth. You will have spiritual intercourse with truth and you'll know it. You might know K. I know K. Her parents know her. Her parents actually have known her longer. I know her more. And then the truth makes you free. 
doesn't set you free, makes you free. So back to the original question. How many know that God is able to work all things together for good? Yeah, now, we're, now you're all like, uh, amen. No, wait. We'll just wait and see what it does to the other person. Um, Romans 8, 28, probably one of the most misunderstood, misquoted scriptures I think I've ever had anybody ever recite back to me. And we know God is able to work all things together for good. For those that love him and are called according to his purpose. So the part where God works all things together for good is connected to the other two parts. Amen. So here's my desire. I want, um, based upon even how uh, Pastor Tommy introduced me to you, I'm anointed. And it's not because of me, obviously, it's because of the Spirit of God. Jesus was the same way. He was just as flesh as you are. But he was filled with the Spirit of God. He was more yielded than any man ever has been yielded to the Spirit of God. But his flesh was not God. Right. That's right. Amen. Amen. Your flesh is not God. So when you're filled with the Spirit of God in your natural human flesh, then you become Christ-like or Christ-in, christ Christian, Christian. And when you're Christian, you're a little Christ. So I'm a little Christ. Amen. The difference is I can say it without getting goosebumps on the back of my neck because I've been doing it 20 years. You can barely say it because you think you're blaspheming. Talk about making your father not feel so awesome. He made you a son and then you don't even want to believe it. He made you a daughter. You don't even want to believe it. Well, I'm not the son of God. No, but you're a son of God. You're not the only begotten son, but you are adopted. Anybody adopted in here? You know, one of the cool things about being adopted, your parents pick you. I've got two kids. They're teenagers. I didn't pick either of them. For those of you that think that I ain't got some anointing, I got a 19-year-old daughter and a 17-year-old son. Talk about tribulating. I have tribulated. I have worked out my salvation with fear and trembling. <laughs> After being married for 24 years to somebody way out of my league and having two kids thrown at me by the Lord Jesus Christ, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> You are who your father says you are. Anybody else or anything else calls you anybody else or anything else. It's just a lie. The Young's literal of that verse says that for those that are active in loving God. It says those to, we have known that to those loving God, not those that have loved God. You know, this is, this is really where we lose a lot of folks. And this isn't even where I'm going. We lose a lot of folks in this promise because this is a promise. God is able to work all things together for good. Amen. I want you to think about the magnitude of that promise. That means there is absolutely nothing that has ever happened that is currently happening or ever will happen that God is not able to take that and literally slap the devil's face Amen. with the testimony Amen. of what that is. Amen. Nothing. Amen. Now, I know some of y'all reflecting back on some bad stuff in your background. First off, you're the only one that remembers that because Jesus doesn't remember that. Because he's removed you from your sins as far as the east is from the west. I don't know if you've ever drove east long enough and you hit west, but you can't do it. Just so you know. We live on a globe, so you can go east all day long and you never get west. Number two is we have a covenant with God that says your sins, your iniquities, he will 
remember no more. You know, when you go to God and you're reminding him about all the jacked up stuff that you did, you're literally telling him things that he on purpose doesn't want to hear. And you're reminding yourself of why the devil's allowed to steal things from you. If we would be way less sin conscious, we would have more application of righteousness in our life. But because we're so quick to go to the negative, it's human nature for us to always go to the negative. When you see someone, the first thing you notice is the things that are wrong with them. Now you look at me like, man, look at that hair on that guy. Man, look at it. That guy's got a twang, and he said he was from Illinois. He's a liar. <laughs> Fifteen years in Texas will do it to you. Uh -huh. Amen. You look at his wife, and you're like, woman, what's wrong with you? <laughs> with that guy. Am I, am I the only one, or does somebody else live there? Like you, The first thing you go to is the negative. What's wrong with it? Go buy a car. What are you looking for? Something that's wrong. <laughs> that ain't how God looks. God sees what's right with you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's why Jesus said, if anybody that has eyes to see, let them see. See what? See the way he sees. If anybody has ears to hear, let them hear. Hear what? Hear the way he hears. He hears what the Father has to say about you, and it is good. Because your Father is good. Amen. This loving relationship, this active loving relationship that we have with him is not something that we once had. Mm -hmm. This is where I said that we lose a lot of people in this great, precious promise that God is able to work all things together for your good. Mm -hmm. Because we once loved Jesus. Mm -hmm. There was a moment in our life, probably a, probably a born again experience, mm -hmm that you were touched by his love and you responded. And it was radical, it was supernatural, and it has impacted you for the rest of your life. And the sad thing is that might have been the last time that you let Jesus get that deep. Because you got it now, don't you? Amen. Thanks for, thanks for what you did, Lord. I'll take it from here. I'll call you if I need you. Amen. Is, it, is this anybody else or is this just me? Am I the only carnal one in the room? Or? You know, if I once loved Kay 24 years ago when we stood at the altar... How successful would our marriage really honestly be? I'm not talking about Facebook successful because you can make anything look good on Facebook. I'm not talking about like come to my fireplace mantle and see the picture of her and I posing for the camera like, hey, we're really in love. Yeah, whatever. And then I beat her at night, you know, and I drink myself into a... Anybody got any neighbors like that? Yeah, amen. I got neighbors like that. I, I try to minister to them, but you know, that everything's good. Uh, uh, isn't that the answer? How you doing today? I'm okay. Yeah. Right. You're okay. What? What's okay? Well, I'm good. Well, well, good. Good what? Jesus said there's none good but God. Yeah. So you're God. Okay. God good. <laughs> like you're literally rocking it the way the Father rocks it. Well, no, I mean not like that. Well, then what do you mean? How's your marriage? Oh, that's good. Whatever you call it shall be the name thereof. Isn't that what the father told Adam? Whatever you name it, that's the name thereof. So when you've got a 20% marriage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and someone says, how's your marriage? And you say, it's good. You've just called 20% good. There is no way for you to get better. But when an anointed man or woman of God walks up to you and says, how's your marriage? And you drop the pride. Mm. Yes. Yes. And you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. God is able to make more grace abound Amen. to those that are humble. And you respond, you say, it's not like it could be. 
And then usually the person like me who asked that question because God prompted my heart to come and ask that question, I'm going to say, I know. I'm here to help. How's your finances? Oh, we're blessed. <laughs> blessed. Right? And then on Monday, you pull out the, the bill, the collector notice. We're coming to take, literally, we're going to take your nose hair because you ain't got nothing left. We're, we're going to pull each one out one at a time. You're going to cry. We're going to, whatever, we're going to. I'm blessed. I'm bl you don't know nothing, Bill Collector. Let me tell you. No, let me tell you. They will take everything. And we will have a horrible testimony to our God, to our neighbors. Well, they took everything from me, but I'm blessed. You know what your neighbor's going to say? Well, thank God I ain't blessed. Thank God. Is this, for, is this too real? Is, are we okay? Like, I don't want to get nothing thrown at me or nothing. Like, like I, I'm trying to help. We, we need to drop the facade and drop all the, all the super cool Christian ease and all this stuff. Like, I get it that we're blessed. We're blessed with all blessings in heavenly places, it says in Ephesians 1, 3, and 6. You're blessed in heavenly places. So, yeah, you have access to blessing, but how much are you accessing it? The Bible tells us that wealth, Paul says that wealth in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, wealth is having the ability to give unto every good work. Do you have that ability? Right. Well, then you are not manifesting wealth the way that the Bible declares for you to manifest it. Exactly right. yes, exactly. And quit messing with people. It's just lies. When you mislead or misdirect people and you do it in Jesus' name. Is this, is this okay for us to come in here, for us all to acknowledge the fact that we need God, that we need the grace of God, we need the anointing of God, we need the wisdom of God, we need the spirit of God, because without any of those things, we are a train wreck waiting for an explosion. But with that, we have the nature of Christ himself. This is so important for us to get this balance. Because God is able to work all things together for good to those that are actively loving him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Yes. Oh, that's legalism. What? You know what? If my wife asked me to stop by the store on the way home from work, I have a part-time job. I wrench on cars. Sorry, does that make me less anointed? If she said to stop by the store on the way home, would it not be an expression of my love? for me to stop by the store and pick my baby up some cream for her coffee in the morning. Is that legalism? Is she putting a demand on? Why would, why would we think that the Lord said, if you love me, keep my commandments? Why do we put that in some category like, well, that, we're not under that. We're under grace. Grace means we can just do anything we want. You know what grace is? Grace is divine empowerment to live a divine life. It's not a divine eraser so we can go live like the world Amen. and call it God. Amen. Amen. Isn't that what the Supreme Court did? Said this is marriage. Marriage can be anything with anyone, anywhere, anytime. Just because the Supreme Court said it doesn't mean it's supreme because the creator of marriage said that it's one man, one woman for all of life. That's what God said. Amen. Just because someone else redefines something doesn't mean that definition is true. You know, there used to be a day and time where in our world, not that even that long ago, that when you asked a person their sex and or their gender, it meant the same thing. Now it doesn't. Because the world has redefined it. Is, is that too deep? Should I get back on like something spiritual? Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You, you've got to be, we've got to be super careful about this stuff because this is what steals the promises from us because we have to know the truth. We have to know the truth. 
So God is able. It doesn't say God will. It's God is able to work all things together for good. Do you want all things to work together in your life for good? Now remember, what's the definition of good? God. That's what Jesus said. Good God. So this isn't even like working out the way that you want it to work out. Can I say that? When you pray, don't do that. Don't box up God. Don't put him in your ability to declare your future. Leave him the opportunity to have a divine declaration about what your future is and say, God, don't work it out this way. Work it out your way. Because, you know, when I work problems out myself and I end up having this like, yay, look what I did. And then God comes along and he's got like a dump truck. And I'm like, oh, that's so, I, yeah, I could have had that. You know, he gives you what you ask. Careful how you ask. So leave him the ability to work it out in a good way. You know how many people I've heard say, well, you know, I got this cancer and it must have been from God because through this cancer I ended up having a better relationship with God. Now, if you've never heard that, you ain't listening because that is normal in the church. I've heard people literally stand up here and testify. Thank you, Jesus, for the cancer that you gave me because of it. Everything on the inside of me wanting to jump and run or tackle them or something. But the reason that happens is because good came out of it. Just because good comes out of it doesn't mean it came from God. Now, I want you to go back through some of the things that you've testified about. Yes, yes, yes. Come on. And you might not want to be testifying the way you've been testifying about it. Because what you're doing is you're projecting on other people, hey, God's going to do some bad stuff so that he can do some good stuff. Right. You know, God doesn't have to do bad stuff to bring good stuff. He can actually just skip the bad and go right to the good. That's the divine characteristic of who God is. Amen. It's, he, he has that ability like, he didn't have to, like, drown the first million Israelis in the, in the Red Sea. And then he's like, okay, now the rest of you can walk on on dry ground. Well, thanks for the death for the first million. We get to stand on their carcasses. No. God doesn't have to do it that way. He can do it a divine way. Well, hey, I'll just park the thing and walk on dry ground. Okay, that's better. That's better. God is able to work all things together for good to those that love him. And here's where I want to rest for just a minute. That are called according to his purpose. Called. The word called is, uh, in the Greek, is the word summons. It's like what a, what a judge does. Amen. Nobody in here knows anything about that. It's a summons. You know, you don't have to show up. Anybody know that? When you're summoned by a judge, you don't have to show up. They'll come by later on with the popo and they <laughs> have a little thing called a warrant. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and then you won't see a smiling judge. You'd be like, hey. But you don't have to show up. You know, let me make some sense for you for those of you that struggle with condemnation. You know when the scriptures say many are called and few are chosen? You know how people usually say that? Well, you know, God, God might call me, but, you know, I might not be qualified for the, for the choosing part. He might leave me behind. Because I did some stuff. I thought some stuff. I hurt some people. I, can I say this, that why would he call someone that he's not willing to choose? You, you think God likes this big meanie. Like, the calling is something that God issues to everyone. The response is something few, few ever do. You know, we know that this is almost too good to be true news. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the world doesn't know how good it is. Sometimes the reason they don't know how good it is is because they look at us. Paul said that we are the epistle written for all men. If your neighbor can read you and say, well, that's not a very good letter. 
And, and I'm not saying this to make you feel bad about whatever lifestyle things you are. Here's what I'm saying. You know, the world actually understands that humility and transparency are really favorable characteristics. Then why don't we possess them in the church? And then we get to the other side of it where it's just like, well, I'm just an old sorry sinner and I just continue to sin and I'm a loser and I'm this. And, and we go overboard with it. We get in the other ditch of the road. And so the world even kind of looks at us and says, well, man, you need Jesus. Because you're jacked up. No, I have Jesus. No, you don't. Not even a little. You're either a sinner or a saint. So if you're born again, amen. you're not a sinner that needs to be saved. You were a sinner. You got saved. Romans 6 says that once you got saved, that was a carcass. That thing was buried. It was dead, died, dead, dead. I think it's 27 times in one chapter. It says dead, 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 dead. Your old man is dead. That's why Ephesians 4, 23 and 20, 22, 23 and 24 says that you need to put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, you need to put off the old man after his, after his lifestyles of sin and deceit. You put off. God, please make me more holy. How in the world is he going to do that? He's, he has born you again and he has filled you with the Holy Spirit. Can you please tell me what more God can do for you? He cannot make you respond. He can summon you. He can call you into the holy of holies. But if you don't feel like you're qualified to get in there. Hebrews 4.16 says, let him boldly come into the throne room of grace and obtain mercy at a time of need. You know what boldness is required for you to get into that place with the Father? You know, if my son came home, he's 17 and he plays football and he eats a lot. And if he came in and let's say you were over at my house and we were all palling together and we were hanging out in the kitchen and my son came home and he's, he's got three, four inches on me. And he came home and, and he walked into the kitchen and he's seen us all standing there and he hit the floor. Oh, daddy. Oh, father. May I please have a piece of cheese from the refrigerator? Please. If you were at my house and you seen that happen, you would likely call the, de the Department of Child Welfare Services on me, <laughs> Pastor Steve, because somehow that boy is not being fed right. I'm abusing him. And we talk to the father that way. You know what would happen most likely if you were at my house? My boy would come to the door. What's up, y'all? And you know what you'd say? That kid feels bold around here, don't he? That's right. That's right. Why don't we do that with the father? You, do you think that would make me feel bad if my son came home and ate the food that we bought for him as a family? Right, right, right. Well, who do you think you are? You better ask. He did. He asked. Right. It was in baby talk when he first came out of the womb. It was in blah, and that meant, hey, you're going to feed me for the rest of my life. <laughs> Amen. And for a couple years, you get to feed me and wipe it out at the bottom. Yay. <laughs> and my wife said, amen. <laughs> You've been subjected to vanity. Yeah. Most of our lives are literally revolving around vanity. I assume this is my reminder here. I better get on my, I better get on my pony. <laughs> You've been subjected to vanity. Anybody know what vanity is? You, you think what it is is you look in the mirror and you like what you see. That's not vanity. That's the world's version of vanity. Vanity is inutility. Vanity is futility. It is frustration. It is confusion. You can see this in Romans 8.20. All of creation was subjected to vanity. All of creation had a purpose. 
I'm going to make one of the most important statements you may ever hear for the rest of your entire life. Anything ever created was created with purpose. Yes. Yes. And I'm telling you, I, can't, I do not have the words to tell you the weightiness of you getting that. Anything and everything ever created has purpose. If you do not know the purpose of an object, you will abuse it, misuse it, and lose the benefit of it. I'm going to say that again because I want this to go into your heart. If you do not know the purpose of a thing, you will abuse it, misuse it, and lose the benefit of it. For all the men in the room, if I think that my Phillips head screwdriver is a chisel, (laughs) and I use it as such for 10 years, will I be able to, in the future, remove a Phillips head screw when I need to? Because I did not know the purpose, I abused it, I misused it, therefore I lost the benefit of it. For all the gals in the room, if I think a bobby pin, it belongs in my husband's tool chest, for him to do something like he just did with that Phillips head screwdriver, you are going to have issues when it comes to going to the next wedding that you're invited to. Because it's going to be misused, abused, and you're going to lose the benefit of that bobby pin. It only takes one super stretch on that thing and it's done. (laughs) Now let's drill this thing home. If you don't know the purpose of marriage. Amen. Amen. (laughs) You will abuse it. Or her. Or him. You'll misuse her or him. And you will lose the benefit of her or him. This happens all the time in the church. Because here's the thing. Like we've got this this holy ability to take scriptures and let them know. Don't you know what you're supposed to do? Let me quote you a verse. Sucker. (laughs) Come on now. Am I wrong? Well, you know what the Bible says to you, woman. No, what does it say? Well, I'm not going to tell you. You just need to. Mm-hmm. If you don't know the purpose, you will abuse it. How about children? Amen. How about the anointing? You think you're filled with the Holy Spirit so that you could be called Pentecostal and be in a super cool group and have a t-shirt and a handshake? Or did Jesus say the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to heal the sick? I'm not going to have anybody raise their hands, but how many times this week did you lay hands on the sick? Preach the gospel to the poor? How many people trapped in poverty did you go tell the good news that they don't have to be poor anymore this week? Now, don't raise your hands. Recovering of sight to the blind. You see a blind person, the first thing is, oh, that poor person. I just wish I could do something. That's the purpose of the anointing. It's not to make you feel good and get goosebumps in worship. If you don't know the purpose of a thing, you'll abuse it, misuse it, and it'll lose the benefit of it. How about money? <laughs> you know, one day I'd like to be invited to a church and I'd want the Lord to say, hey, you know, just go preach that thing where everybody jumps and shouts and says hallelujah the whole time during the sermon. <laughs> I am literally waiting for that day. 
Because every time I pray, when I go to a place, he's always like, hey, bring this. I'm like, yeah, but folks don't like that. He says, I know, they killed me for it too. So if you want to string me up, I'm in good company. Amen. <laughs> Just don't do it right now. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Not in front of my wife. Do it later. You know, this is why people don't give. They don't know what the purpose of money is. I have a Jewish friend who said, you American Christians... The reason you guys are so broke is because you have no idea what money's for. I said, who in the world do you think you... No, I didn't say that. I said, teach me, you're a Jew. He said, okay. He said, when you get your tax return, what do you do? I said, I'm not answering. He said, well, if you're average, you're going to buy a TV or you're going to buy a new couch or you're going to buy you know, a car or something like that because... Because that's what you do. You take your extra and you blow it on something that has no value, that is depreciating, and will probably eventually cost you more money. Would you like to know what we do as Jews? If we get three or five thousand extra dollars that come into our life, we think, how can I turn this five thousand dollars into ten? And so then that Jewish person that you make fun of for being a Jew, who's really tight, who have a little 19 inch TV instead of the 79 inch TV. Because he ain't got time to watch TV anyway because he just went and started a dry cleaner and then he bought an auto dealership and then he... And then he's got six, seven, eight million dollars and you're all like, hey man, will you loan a brother some money? He's like, go get a new TV. No, I won't. We don't know what the purpose of money... You know, it says in Ephesians, it says, let him who stole steal no more. But rather... Let him work with his hands that he may have to give. You know what the purpose of your job is. The purpose of your job is to provide seed so God can bring wealth to your life. And you think the purpose of your job is to get a pension, hopefully after 40 years of you being a good little slave. This is why we just do what we got to do to not get fired. Because if you were actually doing it as unto the Lord, you wouldn't be doing it by C efforts. <laughs> Amen. And buddy? <laughs> Amen. That's good. I know I've, I used to run 63 restaurants. I've owned restaurants. I've owned businesses. I know you, there's a difference between a person who's doing things with purpose and someone that's just living in futility. Yeah. Just give me another paycheck so I can go blow it on another thing and have another. But, but don't you know I'm in such great debt? You know, God can get anybody in this room out of debt in 90 days. Amen. Actually, God can probably do it in 90 minutes. But. You know, slaves live like slaves. I can look at your paycheck, not your paycheck. I can look at your check register and I can tell you what you love. I can look at your check register and I can tell you what the purpose of your life is. That you think, not what God thinks. But I can tell you. Based upon what's there and what's missing, I can tell you what you believe is the most important things and the purpose of your life. Amen. Because you are sowing into, with time and money, with mental thought, you are sowing into things that you find to be the most important things in your life. And your check register usually will list, in ascending order, what is the most important things. And then we're a slave to a job because we've got to keep up 
funding all of the very, very temporal things that are incredibly expensive. Amen. No, 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 sit down, standing ovations. I, no, no, I, I know for all of you out there in YouTube land, it, they're, they're, it's like a standing, you know, it's, can you hear how raucous? Good word, preacher. No, really, thank you. It was all Jesus. <laughs> amen. I got one. That was like, that was a welfare amen right over there. <laughs> he just gave me that from the government right there. Like, well, I'll give him something. All right. A little food stamp. John 8, 29. This is Jesus' life verse. Anybody want to know what Jesus' life verse was? In other words, you want to live your life with the same purpose that Jesus lived his life? John 8, 29. Jesus said, He who has seen me, who has sent me, is with me. Can you say the same thing? He who has sent me is with me. Is the one that birthed you, created you, is he with you? Because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So if you say, no, he's not with me, then you're a liar. Or you're not born again. Either one of the two we can fix today. So Jesus said, he who has sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. I want you to see how much value Jesus placed on intimacy and connection with the Father. And how little we value it. I know we value it very little because when you say prayer meeting at the church, you'll get four people and two of them are being paid part time. Amen. I pastor too. Uh, Y'all ain't the only church. <laughs> Look how much value. You know, Jesus literally would skip sleep for prayer. We wouldn't skip a nap for prayer. Jesus would skip meals after meals after meals to spend time with the Father. If I told you to fast right now, I will guarantee you I'll have to pull somebody's pen out of the side of my neck. <laughs> Look at us. Go on a mission trip to a country where they don't have freely flowing food, and you'll find out the difference physically between people who need and people who don't. If we needed intimacy with Jesus the way we think we need food. He has not left me alone, for I always... Do the things mm -hmm. that are pleasing to him. Mm -hmm. I always do. Man, I want, if there's anything I want to be on my tombstone, he always did what was pleasing to the Father. He always, always did what was pleasing to the Father. I just want to please my father. You know, if I please my father, I'll please my wife. If I please my father, I'll please my neighborhood. I'll please my city. I'll please my community. I'll please. There's no one that I would rather please than the father. And there's no one that we usually spend more time trying to please than ourselves and others. If I just had this, I'd be happy. Can I say this? If you're not happy with Jesus, you can't be happy with anything else. If Jesus don't do it for you, it ain't going to get done. That's right. If you feel like you're missing something and you got Jesus... You don't know what you got. You don't know who you got. I'm going to read two verses. I'm done. 
2 Timothy 1.9. I'm going to read it in the Amplified if anybody has one of them. For he delivered us and saved us and called us with a holy calling. A calling that leads to a consecrated life. A life set apart. A life of purpose. Not because of our works. Or because of any personal merit. We could do nothing to earn this. But because of his own purpose and grace, his amazing, undeserved favor, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus before the world began, eternal ages ago. His love and his grace has given you the ability to live in purpose. Eternal divine purpose. And the last verse I want to quote to you, this is Apostle Paul, who was a man successful in purpose. And because of it, no matter what came at him, he had a solution for it. I press toward the mark for the high calling, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, Philippians 3.14. I press. I press. You know, if you're pressing, then the world can't press on you. If you're in stress, if you're in depression or oppression, it's because you are focused on you. You've created a vacuum and the world is filling it. But when you press out, I can tell a person that comes up and they're under deep, deep depression. I can solve it just like that. If you ever become Christ-focused instead of self-focused, your depression will never, ever return. Amen. You cannot be depressed thinking about Jesus. You cannot not be depressed thinking about you. I press towards the mark. In other words, don't think about way off out there 80 years down. You think about the mark for today. Yeah. The mark for this hour. Yeah. The mark for tomorrow. The mark for this week. I press towards the mark for the prize. Why on purpose? Because there's a prize, beloved. There's a prize for this. There's a crown. For some of us, there's many crowns that the Lord is literally fashioning based upon how we live our lives. Man, if there's ever a trophy to be won, wouldn't that be the trophy? Of the high calling. This isn't an earthly calling. This isn't a temporal calling. This is God-sized. God-sized. You know, there are nations in some of you. Yes. Yes. There are millions in some of you. There are literally hundreds or thousands of people on the other end of you living your life and your purpose. If we could just get us off the throne long enough to let his purpose be our purpose. Just long enough. If you've felt like your life has been literally just a dog chasing his tail. If, if you, maybe you say, well, I want to know my purpose. And if I knew my purpose, I'd have my purpose. I can tell you this, that you can start with the general purpose. Yeah. Amen. It's, good. it's called the Great Commission. It's called intimacy. We're all called to this. From the general purpose, you'll find your intimate purpose. But if you feel like that, I mean, you're just, you've missed it. You know what sin, the definition of sin is in the Greek? It's missing the mark. You think it's some action. It's not even a verb, y'all. Even Anybody ever teach you? Sin's not even a verb. That's a noun. That's a person, place, or thing. Sin is missing the mark. And it's talking about identity. It's a person. It's you. Yeah. That's very good. Thank you. Man. There it 
if you felt like that you've just missed it, I mean by a little or by a lot. Some of us miss it by a little, I get that. Some of us miss it by a lot, I get that. Either way, they both have the same corrective actions to press the right direction. So if you're in here, I'm going to pray this over you. Now listen, this is only going to work for those that want this prayed over you, that are going to be humble enough to stand up and are going to receive the prayer. I'm specifically only going to pray this for the folks who stand up. Because God is a gentleman. He ain't going to force himself on none of y'all. He will love folks so much and he will honor them so much that he will allow them to go to hell against his will and against his love because he loves you and he has given you free will. But if you want to have his purpose and maybe some of you for the first time in your life, maybe some of you for the last time in your life because maybe you've prayed along this line and something's gotten sideways and crisscrossed and stuff happened and you know and she left me and that guy did that thing and and at work this happened and so, I don't know I just got into debt and so I found a cycle a rut you know what a rut is it's a grave with the ends knocked off if you're in a rut you weren't created to be there you were created to rule and to reign. You can't do that from a grave. So if this is for you, if you desire to be on purpose, life on purpose, not just be drug around like any old mule with a bit and bridle, because the world will do it if you let them. They'll put you in slave stocks and they will beat the fire out of you until you lose all will to live. Mm -hmm. Or you can bust out of there like Superman out of a phone booth. (laughs) And the world ain't never known what hit him. Life on purpose. His purpose. Divine purpose. Eternal purpose. This is you. I would like for you to stand, please. And I'm going to pray this over you. Father, I thank you for the humility that's over these folks that are willing to stand and acknowledge the fact that they're not there. You know, if you shoot for the moon and you miss, you might hit the stars. But if you never shoot for anything, you'll have it every time. You know why... People live their lives hugging trees and trying to save the spotted owl and, and people walk around and with rainbow clothes on half naked and they march for pride for something that's not even right. You want to know why? You know, we want to be quick to condemn them. You want to know why? Because they found a purpose. They're willing to give their life to their purpose. It might be a wrong purpose. It might be a bad purpose. It might be a temporal. At least they're doing it. Oftentimes, Christians, the most lethargic, just watch the world go by, won't do nothing. That's not going to be you, beloved. That's not going to be you. If you don't have his purpose, any old purpose will do. You could probably tell me every character in your favorite show and what's going to happen on the next episode because you've already been there. I can't tell you anybody in a TV show. You can tell me every stat from the World Series. I can't tell you who's in the World right. Series. Yeah. Amen. Praise God. I don't want you to have any old purpose. I want you to have his purpose. There it is. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. This is the purpose we're committing you to. Now, it's an eternal purpose, Amen. which means that everything you do is going to have an eternal impact. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Amen. That's weighty, but it's beautiful. Yes. yes. Are you ready for this? Yes, sir. All right, close your eyes. God's going to speak some things to you about your purpose. He's going to tell you to where to start, press towards the mark. The mark. For some of us, it's just not a 180-degree turn. You know, if you're going 100 miles an hour and you go in reverse, you're buying a transmission. If you're going 0.1 mile an hour and you put it in reverse, you'll be going that way. 
So for some of you, God's going to have to start changing some marks to slow you down. And that's okay. He can do it. He loves you. He's willing to work with you with however much you're willing to give him. But when you start getting that momentum picked up and you start steaming down that hill like them old trains, those of you that are old enough, there used to be a shaving cream. They'd put it on the railroad tracks and no train could ever could ever get held back by that shaving cream. They were trying to say it was thick, but it wasn't thick enough. You know, some of those issues and problems in your life, if you just built up a good head of steam, <laughs> you'd blast right through them. Maybe your health isn't contingent on your confession. Maybe it's contingent on your focus. Maybe your finances, maybe your marriage, maybe your relationships, maybe your children. Not contingent on your spiritual cycles, your religious. Amen. Maybe it's just contingent on you always doing those things that are pleasing to the Father. And then Jesus said, if you seek first the kingdom, then all these things. You won't have to confess them. You won't have to stand on them. You won't have to believe them. Just all these things, your father knows you have need of them, and he brings them. You focused on what he tells you to focus on, and he'll be honorable to focus on what he said he'll do as a good father. It's not your job to provide for yourself. That's your daddy's job. Father, I pray for all these. Man, this is everybody. Praise God. I have never had anybody. I've never had everybody respond to this. What a church, Pastor Tommy. Father, you see this humility. You see the sincerity and the genuineness that is in this room. You see that these are folks. This is not a response to religion. This is a response from people's hearts. God, you are the God. You are the Father of hearts. You don't look at the outward stature of a man, but you see the heart. So right now, you see these hearts. You see folks that are right now willing to lay down anything and everything. And for some of them, you're going to ask them to. But some others, like Abraham, you might ask them to, but then when it comes right down to the nitty-gritty, you'll provide a sacrifice for yourself. But I'm willing to give my firstborn. I might not have to, but I'm willing to. I'm willing to give that thing that I've worked 20, 30, 40 years for. I might not have to, but I'm willing to. I'm willing to give up my own face, my own self-opinion of myself. I'm willing to humble myself and say, I ain't got it figured out. I need help. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, you see what's going on right here. And I thank you that where the missing of the mark abounds, your divine empowerment does much more abound. Nobody's ever missed it so bad that you can't fix it. You are even way more capable than the average GPS. Recalculating, recalculating, recalculating. Right now, the Father's recalculating some of your lives. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The end is going to be more glorious than the beginning. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So right now I'm going to proclaim a blessing over you. I would like for you to hold out your heart. This is another way the Jews have beaten us. American Christians, they profess blessings over their children nearly every night. The father would lay his hands on his children's head. I'm allowing the father to lay his hand on your head right now. Right now, literally. If you believe the book of Revelation, that means Jesus Christ is literally walking through these aisles right now. He says he walks amongst the candlesticks, and the candlesticks were the churches. 
So Jesus is walking these aisles right now. And he's coming by. And at the utterance of this blessing, he's laying his hands on his children's head. You might feel it. Beloved, I pray above all things that you prosper and you are in good health even as your soul prospers. Thus says your Father. If you receive that, close your hands and tuck it in your heart. That's the Father's blessing over you. Thank you so much for having me. Honor to you, Pastor Tommy. I love you guys.